this. Let's do this. All right. Hey, as we're uh, getting settled in to um, to hear and read and open God's word today, um, you can begin turning to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 is what you want to turn to. Uh, this past week, uh, really, really just been listening to the Lord and uh, and particularly how it's sort of built up to this particular Sunday and uh, and continuing to simply be sensitive to what the Lord wants even even now and even into this time together in worship around and in his word. And, uh, and so with that, why don't we pray? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this holy and sacred uh, moment that you've given us. Um, it is truly a miracle that you have given us breath in our lungs and life today. And oftentimes we know, Lord, our hearts wander, our, our minds get distracted, and we, we often forget to thank you for the miracle of life and breath. And this morning we're grateful and we're thankful. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be a faith community, both here in person and even those that are online. Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray, Lord, that as we open your word, specifically in Isaiah 9 today, may your spirit continue to work in the depths and recesses of our mind, heart, and soul. Help us to continue to be sensitive and open and available and ready, Lord, to respond when sometimes the response is, well, not what we like. I pray that you would help us, uh, Lord, to center and, and focus on you. So, Lord, get me out of the way today. And may your word speak the truth that has already been written. Thank you, Father, that we have this precious opportunity this time to lean into you. We thank you in Jesus' name and all God's people said. So we've been on this journey for several months of this sermon series called Light and Dark, and the challenge has been this, that all of us, everyone, has to choose light or darkness. And uh, I'm going to tell you that in coming into this sermon series, I, I didn't necessarily put an end time to to when we would end this series, but uh, feeling like this is now coming to sort of a, a landing, if you will, and this is uh, the last to second, uh, actually it's the, it's the next week, next Sunday will be the last uh, uh, sermon for this particular series, and, and I have to say that this has really been an encouraging, a challenging, uh, a breath of fresh air kind of sermon series for me personally. And, and I always say that uh, when, when you get the opportunity to actually bring God's word, what, what's, what's cool but challenging, it's like that paradox in the kingdom, you know. It's like, it's like incredibly glorious, but it's also incredibly like sobering. That when you bring the word, actually the posture of your heart is when it when the posture of your heart is, Lord, I I want to be able to first and foremost preach to myself before I actually deliver a message. Uh, the Lord does incredible work, and so that's what this sermon series has been for me personally. And so two weeks left. This is the second to last message for this sermon series, and I have an interactive question because we are in. Awesome. There's going to be a shirt someday. I know there will be. I'm just going to prophetically say it. Uh, here's, the, here's the question. What comes to your mind in terms of, like, descriptive words? What descriptive words come to your mind when you hear this particular phrase, as the dark gets darker, the light gets lighter? 
What are some descriptive words that come to your mind when you hear that? Contrast. What? Inevitable. Exposure. Hope. Power. Good job, Stefan. I recognized you last week, brother. What else? Truth. That's good. What comes to mind when you hear as the dark gets darker, the light gets brighter? Conflict. God wins. Amen, Brandon. What else? Anything else? All right. So I, I want you to be honest, okay, because we are real people serving the living God through love and mission. Okay, so be honest with me. Does this particular phrase, as the dark gets darker and the light gets lighter, does this bring you anxiousness, worry, or peace? How many of you say that that actually brings peace to me? Raise your hand. Uh, how, many, how many would say that that kind of brings a little bit of anxiousness and worry? Yeah, like the dark getting darker? Yeah, 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 it's okay. How many of you would be on the fence on that? Like, uh, it's kind of like, uh, there's a conflict. I think somebody said there's a conflict there. As the dark gets darker, the light gets brighter. Well, I'm here to declare to you this morning, and I have been saying this on repeat throughout this sermon series, that opposition is actually opportunity. Can I get an amen? Opposition is opportunity. Isaiah chapter 9 If you're there, and we're going to dive into the first seven verses of this book, the entire book of Isaiah is prophecy. The prophet Isaiah foretells the coming of Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, prophesying his life, his death, his deliverance, and his salvation. Isaiah is a book of prophetic language of Jesus' first coming and also regarding his second coming. Now, chapter 9 is a prophecy that predicts the end of darkness and gloom and the coming of a time of joy and peace and salvation. And so how is this going to come to pass? It is, in fact, in and through King and Savior, Jesus. You can say amen. This is, in fact, what's happening here leading up to Isaiah chapter 9. Now, the announcement of significant hope among or in the midst of darkness is, in fact, a central theme in this scripture passage. During a period marked by oppression and despair, the promise of light infiltrates the hearts of those dwelling in spiritual and physical darkness. The people of Galilee, once harassed by foreign invasion, are in the middle or amidst predictions of significant divine intervention of God's deliverance and salvation. So in some ways, I guess I'm saying, get into the story, if you will. This passage that we're going to read today declares that there will be a turning point. That what is happening right now is not, in fact, the end. There's going to be a turning point where light will, in fact, break through the prevailing gloom, symbolizing the coming of a Savior and King. And so, if you will, Isaiah looked forward to that which you and I look back upon as we read Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali, by the way, this is where Jesus grew up and began his earthly ministry. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled. But there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. Verse 2. The people who walk in darkness runs between the Jordan, I'm sorry, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. 
For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Say, will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. This would be a nice exercise through these seven verses that we read. Just circle the word will. Verse, uh, here we go. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. Here we go. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Will make this happen. The title of my message this morning is simply The End of Darkness. The End of Darkness. And I'm just going to go ahead and prophetically declare it. I know I'm preaching to somebody today. The End of Darkness. And so I have good news. Because we have God's word, and I want to, that somebody, I want to declare over you Psalm chapter 30, verse 5. Here we go. Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. You know, there's lots of weeping going on today. Lots of mourning and tears and concern about what's happening in our homes, what's happening in our neighborhoods, what's happening in our world. And I see what's happening, this spirit of war that's, that's, that's here physically. We see what's happening in the Middle East, and we see all, f- like, f- several fronts specifically trying to corner, particularly Israel. And this past week, I had the opportunity to uh, attend a pastor's gathering conducted at William Jessup University, and the speaker there was Rabbi Kurt Snyder, and a man that I actually, goes back a couple years ago, I've been following and listening to him. And what was so cool about his time, his brief time with us as pastors is first and foremost, the call for us in this region, uh, so church, you can be encouraged by this, like the call, the like the mandate to continue at the forefront of what we do, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is, in fact, the gospel that changes lives. Amen? And so he gave this incredible report. You have to go digging and searching to actually find this stuff, that what's happening in Israel right now is prophetic, Do you know that so many people who have rejected Christ, particularly the Jewish community, have rejected Jesus? There's a remnant. There are people who we could call Messianic Jews who know that Messiah has come, that Messiah has already come and done the work on the cross to provide us forgiveness of sins. But there is an incredible outpouring and revival in this small area that's the size, not even bigger than New Jersey, Israel. And there is a a revival happening right now of the Jewish people who are coming to Messiah, who are giving their lives to Jesus, who are surrendering 
what they have tried so hard to keep and run from Jesus, but they're coming to the Father. What's unique about that is you see all the stuff that's happening in the midst of it. Great war and, and, and trauma and, and murder. I mean, just so much stuff is happening. And church, you need to be encouraged that God doesn't abandon us in the darkness, you understand. That his purposes and plan play out according to his great plan and glory so that he may be magnified and lifted up. And so be encouraged. I was encouraged this past week to hear this firsthand and even to see on video some who have given their lives to Christ through this time, particularly this past year in Israel. You know, the reason why we are able to confidently declare the end of darkness this morning is because of this. It's because Jesus has come. It's because Jesus is come. And it is because he is coming back again. Darkness is and darkness has already been defeated. It's already been defeated. And throughout Isaiah chapters 7 and 8 that lead up to chapter 9, the prophet Isaiah looks forward to the future and he outlines the consequences for rejecting the way of faith in and through Jesus, through Messiah. And Isaiah announces that because many in Judah, including the king himself, King Ahaz, have rejected the way of faith and have chosen instead to live in the in the short term, in the temporary, by what their eyes could only see, the nation as a whole would be plunged into deep darkness and gloom. Deep darkness. But here's the good news. Here is the good news. That even in such darkness, God would preserve a faithful remnant a portion of his people, listen, who still trusted in him. Those marked out not only by their national identity as Israelites and Judites, but by their spiritual identity as a people who hunger and thirst for the Lord and for his promises. For people like that, here's what we come to uh, sorry, here's where we come to the, what, if you will, the burst of light, the Shekinah glory, the glory of the light of Jesus when the day of salvation would eventually dawn. And we see this expressed in this passage, Isaiah 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. And so how can we confidently conclude that darkness has ended, that darkness will, yes, come to a complete end? The answer, I've already given it, and I'm going to put it on repeat again and again and again. The reason why we have this confidence that, that yes, the end, this is the end of darkness, it is always and forevermore, the answer, the cure, is Jesus. The answer, the cure, is Jesus. And so this morning, briefly, I want to provide for you three truth realities, three truth realities to get you and I, to get us recentered around a biblical, spiritual-led mindset, heart set, and reset. That's the goal this morning. That we're putting that right on the table. And so the first thing that we want to talk about is a mindset. We want to set our minds rightly. Because you and I know that the enemy goes after first and foremost your mind. He wants to thwart and distract and disrupt and get you discombobulated through a different mindset, a mindset that, in fact, gives us a way forward, which is the mind of Christ. Can I get an amen? The mind of Christ. So we are to set our minds rightly. And so this is the mindset. Can we read this together? Ready? 
This world is not our home. Let's do it again. This world is not our home. You know, that's actually just an interesting practical exercise that sometimes we have to do. That when we, and it's okay, like if people say, well, why are you talking to yourself? It's like, no, I'm talking to Jesus. I'm just confirming out loud what that which is in my heart and getting a good right mindset in the hour that we're in today, we can simply declare this world is not our home. I love this quote, this image. It comes from Hebrews 13, verse 14. This world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. So we're in this middle ground. We're in this middle ground. But church, this world is not our home. And I want you to consider this, that when Isaiah writes what he he writes here in chapter 9, some 700 years before Christ's birth and his incarnation. That's just a fancy word that simply means God in a bod, incarnation. It's, It's God in the flesh, a gift by God himself that he would come to you and I, come to us, to this world in flesh, in humanity, but yet at the same time in his divinity, God in a bod. This was 700 years that we see here before the actual coming of Messiah. Isaiah chapter 9 is declaring that there's an end to darkness. And here Isaiah is speaking into a bleak and dark situation that's literally unfolding in his own day. It's happening. Boots on the ground, right here, right now. He sees God's people descending into a time of darkness and gloom. Listen, what Isaiah sees, many do not see. That's what's happening here. What Isaiah sees, many do not see. Yet in the context of that, the prophet Isaiah also looks forward to a future like a future day where he sees a dramatic reversal, like a shift, a change, a reversal on the horizon, a reversal that overthrows expectations. And for Isaiah, the Spirit of God revealed to him that this darkness and deep sadness, this despair would in fact reverse and come in and through a person, Jesus, the living God, the same Then, as today, Jesus is the one that has ended darkness for good. And in Isaiah's day, Jesus, the coming Messiah, is the one that will end darkness for good. Do you understand, church, what I'm doing there? It's already been fulfilled. Jesus has come, has reconciled us to the Father. Do you you get the... Do you understand where that transformation comes from? Like he has come to give us life and life to the fullest, that we could be forgiven and be in right standing with the living God, be in relationship with the living God. Have you considered that deeper today? It's incredible when we think about this different mindset or this confirmed mindset that this world is not our home, The challenge for you and I this morning is this. If all you see is darkness and despair, here's the bad news. Darkness and fear and anxiety and all the things that that sort of manifest darkness, if all you see is darkness and despair, this will, in fact, overtake you. But if you see darkness yet the greater light, listen, faith in Christ will increase and sustain you. Now, I know I'm preaching to somebody today because because you have, without any condemnation, the darkness is overtaking you because there's something that you're not seeing and experiencing, which is, in fact, the truth, the light of Jesus. 
You understand in this hour, church, God is testing our faith to grow and increase our faith today. He's doing that on the earth. Not testing like a substitute teacher that hopes and prays that you fail. No, actually in going to strengthen, continue to strengthen your faith in this hour, which is the prayer, I felt it during worship in song this morning, a deep, deeper hunger and thirst for more, which means a deeper faith and increasing of faith in this hour. Could it be that God's actually answering this prayer? That God is answering the, the deepest prayer of your heart that even when you're praying and nobody's even hearing or seeing, but God does and he hears. What an incredible time that we're living. But church, this is good news that the world is not our home. Like for reals, it's not, this is not our home. Depression and anxiety is lengthened and prolonged on this basis when all of your focus and energy is centered on trying to make this world your home. I'm here to tell you in love, it is not. It is not. You know, you've often heard me say this, and I just want to explain it a little bit deeper. I, I, I say this, the best is yet to come. Now, what I mean by that is this is not the end. Uh, the best is yet to come. There is a glorious coming day that's on the horizon when every wrong will be made right. That, listen, every and all darkness will disappear. And do you know that? Like, this is, this is the truth of the promise of what, in fact, is coming. It's not our place to decide, well, that's not coming tomorrow. That's not coming in 10 years from now. It hasn't. So I don't really have to pay, my, pay attention to that. No, like, look, like, keep looking to Christ. Keep looking to Jesus. Even in the midst of the darkness, your faith will increase and will sustain when your focus and your energy and, and, and your empowerment through the Holy Spirit is focused on Christ, the best is yet to come. And Christ is, in fact, coming back to establish his kingdom. Consider this 2,000-year-old prayer that Jesus himself said, continue praying this until it happens. And that is, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I'm just going to tell you, we're close. We're close. Every day is closer to Jesus coming back. That's good news. I want to say, can you taste that? Can you see it? Because when you taste it and when you see it and you see it, you see it established and, 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 and established on God's word that this is not the end. But the end is that darkness will absolutely be obliterated and will no longer exists. This is good news. The second thing that I want us to consider, a truth reality to get us re-centered around a biblical spirit-led heart set. This is the heart set. We need to set our heights, hearts rightly this morning to this fact that we are not home yet. We are not home yet. Uh, I want you to do me a favor. Uh, just take two fingers and just put it right here underneath your chin, and try and find a heartbeat. Try and find your pulse, okay? <laughs> All right, here, here, here's the good news. You're breathing, which means you're not home yet. You have a pulse, you're breathing, which means that you are not home yet. The wor this world is not our home. But it is for now, for such a time as this. And since this is true, you and I are called to stand and hold the line of righteousness and, yes, push back the darkness and fight. We are called to be the light and salt. Say salt. We are called to be the light 
and salt of the earth. Now, what does salt do? It actually protects and preserves from corruption and decay. To be the salt, cultural deterioration from rejecting God, listen, is the responsibility and calling upon the church to be salt. To be salt. We stand in the gap. In breaking news, we are in an election season. We're in an election season. I am encouraging you, church, to stay grounded in God's word. Stay focused on God's word. Let that be the filter by which you not come up with anything that may you that may be you feel, but come through the lens of the truth of God's word. We've been hitting this the last couple of weeks, understanding that in a world that has just watered down truth and your truth is my truth and, and, and which means that there's no truth, but actually there is. And we have it in God's word. Stay grounded in God's word in this particular season. And listen, vote through a biblical lens. Here's the thing. You and I, unique opportunity. Now, here's the thing. We have a unique opportunity unlike those that we read throughout the pages of Scripture that your voice, it's, it's a way to be salt. It's not the way to be salt, but it's a, it's a practical way to be salt in a deteriorating culture that says, I don't want anything to do with God, your Bible, your church gatherings or whatever. We know that this is the spirit of Antichrist. It's been among us ever since sin fractured the world. But listen, unlike those that we read throughout the pages of Scripture, your voice can be made through something called voting. It's an interesting, unique thing. I mean, we have this opportunity. It's a freedom to do this. And, you know, I just want to bring your attention to something that you may not be aware of, Californians. There, a lot of people, have, as I've talked to people, like, they don't even know that this is even on the ballot. It's called Proposition 3. And, uh, and, and this proposition, now, I'm just going to say it. This is an affront to God's creation, which is male and female. But it's also an affront to the family unit ordained, established, created by God. Proposition 3 removes all rules for marriage, opening the demonic door to child marriages, incest, and polygamy. It changes California's constitution by making moms and dads optional, which puts children at more risk. This careless measure harms families and society. Is your heart breaking as I share what is absolutely written? That you're going to be going to the polls in, in just a matter of time. Our hearts need to break. And say, no, this is not going to happen. This this measure literally casts our our culture into more decay. So I'm going to say it. When you go and you look at this proposition, pray through it, look at it even more. I want to tell you, say no to that. Because it's it's enough, it's like so obvious. (laughs) In fact, why don't we pray right now? Father, we need you. I thank you, Lord, that this is not a political issue. It's a biblical issue. Help us, God, even yet now, to be established and confident in the truth of your word. Help us to not apologize by what you say and declare. So, Father, I pray, leading up to next week, pray that you would help us, each of us, Surrendered followers of Jesus, Lord, to stop that which not just harms people, but destroys people. Help us to have the heart of a father who loves. Father, you love us. You've given your life for us. So, Lord, help us to portray and demonstrate the same heart as you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
evil and darkness is increasing in the culture, and so we are called to be light and salt. Now think about what our world would be like if the Holy Spirit was not restraining it. And so who is the, the restraining force that's keeping this world at bay for now? Do you know? The church. And yes, we know that that will soon end. The church. And, uh, and church, I've been saying this. It's true. You're going to have to, as you stand on truth, you just have to stay focused on Jesus because the mockers and the naysayers will come. They're there. Just like this quote or just like this image shows. I mean, they're there. And we're called to pray for those that do not yet have the light of Christ. And the the truth of the matter is is that light exposes darkness. The Holy Spirit gave me this passage of Scripture this week as I was preparing for this message. Psalm chapter 37, verse 7. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at them in defiance, but the Lord just laughs, for he sees their day of judgment coming. Church, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. This world is not our home, but we're not home yet. And so, with a renewed mind and a renewed heart, this is the last point. We are to reset anything and everything. The reset is this, run to the Father. What are we to do now? Where do we go from here? Church, we run to the Father. And towards the end of 2023, coming into this new year, there was a common prophetic voice coming into 2024 that this would be the year of exposure. Exposure. How true this has been. Our word, Living Water Church, for 2024 is... (laughs) <laughs> He's our senior pastor, yes. Do you remember our word for 2024? Alignment. Good job, Charles. Charles, you get the gold star today. Stefan will be there to greet you with the congratulations and the high five in 2025. Hey. Uh, exposure, alignment. If I were to put those, both, both of those words together, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a word that comes to mind, and it's this word. It's repentance, which, by the way, is the door to running to the Father. You want to know what the purpose of the pulpit is? This place, the giving of God's word, the purpose of the pulpit is to declare the authority of biblical truth, the gospel, and also the message of repentance. The coming of Christ thrusts light on those living in darkness. But you know, light shining in the darkness isn't always appreciated. When you're comfortably asleep in your nice warm bed, especially as the weather's changing, the nights are getting a little bit cooler, you're not cool with any idea of being rudely awakened by some bright light. You'd rather turn that light off and go back to sleep. And so it is with those who are complacent in their spiritual sleep, comfortably slumbering in ignorance and rebellion. They don't really want the light of Christ because his light, listen, wakes them up and makes them aware of some things they perhaps do not want to be made aware of. I submit to you, church, that very often what people need the most is what they want the least. That very often what people need the most is what they want the least. 
Before we can even begin to be delivered from the darkness of our sin and ignorance and rebellion, we need to be made aware of it. It is this that causes you and I to run to the Father, not from the Father, but actually to the Father. Repentance is the door to running hard and fast to the Father. And you and I, we must choose righteousness and holiness being set apart in this hour. You want to know what the increasing levels of darkness does, which Satan doesn't even recognize? And it's this, that darkness gives room for the light of Christ to shine brighter. That as darkness gets darker, yes, the promise, yes, the experience is the light of Christ gets to shine brighter. For God's greater glory. Choose light in the midst of darkness. This is good news. Run to the Father. We're going to close out our time together by singing this song. I want to do an extended response time to give each of us the opportunity to extend what the Holy Spirit has been speaking to us and moving in our hearts, centered around his word. We're going to sing this song, Run to the Father. And there's a line that's, uh, that says this, I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Run to the Father. And one of the things that Satan undermines and underestimates is God's gift granted to humanity, which is this, the gift of free will choice. And while the gates of hell try and convince you that choosing God, that choosing light is insignificant because this is darkness's hour and place to rule and reign and that there's no room for you, the light of Christ, Actually, this gives tons of room for the light of Christ to shine brighter. That we can be an aroma in a culture of death. We can be an aroma of life, as 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says. The fragrance of Christ, like a perfume, an expensive perfume, that is in fact life in a culture that speaks and peddles death. What an opportunity, church, that we have in this hour to be the light and life of Christ. That we can stand in the gap for such a time as this. What an opportunity. And so I'm going to give us the time to extend, uh, this extended time to respond. And however you feel fit, like I'm giving you permission, if you want to turn this front part here into an altar. We actually have towels available if you want to come and kneel. I want to give that opportunity. If, if you feel so led to do that, you can come up here. Actually, when we do something physical, something spiritual happens. Not mystically. Actually, when we come out of our comfort and we respond out of discomfort, God does something incredibly comfortable. And he says, you're mine. I'm with you. I'm here not alone. And so for some of you, this is also a time to repent, to turn from running from the Father. This is the call to run to Him. And wherever you are today, wherever you are today, I want to give space and room to come to the Father because He is so worthy and loves you and provides grace. If you want to just sit in your chair during this time, you can do that. If you, if the Holy Spirit leads you to come alongside somebody else, and you know it's like this person over here sitting way over there, and the Holy Spirit like draws you and says, "I need, I just am called to just come over and pray with you. You're not alone. We're in this together." Whatever the Holy Spirit does in this moment, I want to give room for that. So let's stand. And I'm going to do something uh, that this person doesn't even know. Uh, One of our elders, Jack, could you just come up here and just lead our uh, time of prayer in this? Um, And I'm going to have Jack just 
share and, and pray. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, broken vessels, Lord. We recognize, Lord, that we are less than perfect, Father. And while that is bad news, it's good news because you are a great physician. And you take broken people and you set them apart for your good pleasure work in us something that we never knew we could do, Lord. And so, Father, I pray for those, Lord, whose hearts are moved this morning, Father, to trust in you, to run to you, Lord, to find hope, to find salvation, to find strength, Lord, to find solutions to their problems in you, Lord. Be their light, Lord. Darkness has no place in you, Lord. Darkness is powerless against your light darkness is simply the lack of light. And so, Father, I pray that you would bring illumination into people's lives today, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit working in through us, Lord. I pray that you would inhabit the praises of your people today, Lord. And I was thinking about worship today, Lord, about how <laughs> you don't really need it, Lord. It's more for us, Lord. I've never worshipped you and not left more enriched and more alive in so, Father, open up our hearts and our minds to worship and praise you today, unhindered, not to copy others, but to worship you as you've designed us to worship you. <laughs> You're a debtor to no man. We worship you, Lord, and we are the ones who benefit, Father. So be with us today, Lord, as we lift up your name, Lord God, and do the work that only you can do, Lord. And I just pray for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be fully manifested church service today, Lord, that those that have a word of discernment would speak it, Lord, to those that have a word of encouragement to speak it, Father, to those who are gifted with the power of prayer and that would pray with others, Lord, that the gift of healing would be released in Jesus' name, Father, that that uh, demonic oppression would be cast out in Jesus' name, Lord, for the glory of your kingdom, Lord, for the manifest, manifestation of your kingdom here today, Lord, I pray, 